I'd like to welcome to the show director Paul Tanner, stars and writers of the film Simon Phillips and Doug Phillips and Ken Braziers from the upcoming film Stealing Chapman. How are you gentlemen doing today? Doing fine. Well, thank you. Good. We're good. How are you doing? Good, good. Um, before we dive into the film, I figure I, I like to ask kind of a softball question and I'll ask a, a, across the thing, but I'll start off with you guys, Simon and Doug. What was your first job in film? Oh, I know the answer to this. My first job as an actor was at London Zoo as part of the nativity scene. I was one of the three shepherds. And they uh, for, it, it, from 1st of December to the 24th of December, I had a little speech to say as kids sort of filed through the Zoom. And whenever I started speaking, Billy the goat would start headbutting me. Like, what, what was your speech? Don't pretend you don't still remember it. <sighs> yes, three wise men did yonder here pass, you know, following a star headed to Bethlehem. Okay, well, you know what? Thank you for coming in. We'll let you know, okay? Yes, sir. <laughs> I, I, I can't lay claim to anything as grandiose as this. I mean, you know, this man had an impressive beginning. Uh, I wrote a stage play that I also played one of the leads in that won some, won some nice awards and uh, got made into a film. So they cast me in the same role because, well, I'd written it and I was that guy. And uh, yes, we made a movie of my stage play that, uh, of course, never got released. <laughs> so which story is better the london zoo story or that one that's what i said nothing is grand yokes of yours well no one knows and same question to you yeah, well i i will study film production um um in in college and uh spent a whole bunch of time uh uh at ucla um uh, taking the rest of the courses i needed for my for my degree, so at that time, you know, and all the students, we were we were taught, it was kind of like the, the story of Tom Sawyer, that, you know, painting the fence is a lot of fun. So we worked uh, as uh, crew people on various productions in, uh, in California and uh, doing the most ridiculous things in the world. And then of course, when I got out of college, I immediately went into the theater where I knew nothing. Uh, and so I finally came back to film. So. And, and Paul, question to you. Oh, well, my first acting gigs were all at school again in the nativity were uh, uh, over a succession of years, I was either uh, a wise man, um, a shepherd, um, or, uh, or just generally one of the flock. I think my greatest achievement was one year in the song, The 12 Days of Christmas, I was given the line five gold rings to sing. And if you've ever heard that, you know how high you have to hit it. But fortunately, nothing had dropped at that point, so I was able to hit it. I was 18 years old. Yeah, but you can still hit it. Come on, Paul. Come on. We know you want to do it. <laughs> no, I can't do it now. <laughs> Paul, what was your first job? Uh, well, I was um, still in Chapman is inspired by real events to Las Vegas uh, based con men dig up and steal the corpse of comedian Charlie Chapman in order to ransom it with the theft gaining the worldwide's attention and the reward rising daily soon every local lowlife criminal and dirty cop wants a piece of the action Doug and Simon what inspired you to write this story well it's a it's a true story so in the 1970s in Switzerland people two brothers did actually dig up Charlie Chaplin and tried to ransom it to the family unsuccessfully and they were caught. So uh, we started the, thinking that that was a good idea to tell that story and then just just took that idea, but uh, asked Doug to make it about me and Doug and yep. set it in Las Vegas. And right. come, brother coming, from, coming from theater, I specialize in dialogue. So he had the, the idea, the concept, and I put in the dialogue. Yeah. It's just about two brothers. We made one of them good looking and, and the sex, the raw sex appeal. And, uh, you know, that guy. And then one of them was the ugly sort of Eeyore donkey one. <laughs> Ken, what attracted you to play in the film? Well, as a producer, uh, I work free. That was, uh, that was a, a big... Uh, 
<laughs> that was a, a, a very, very attractive situation. Um, no, I, you know, dystopian films, we're all kind of really good friends. And, uh, you know, I, we always want to be part of everything that everybody's doing. I, I like the part. Um, it, it, it was more the dark end of it. And uh, comedy's tough, and I don't like doing tough stuff. So, you know, it was easier <laughs> easier to do that. And, Paul, what attracted you to direct the film? Oh, man. I mean, it's such a crazy it's such a crazy story that when you hear it, you think that can't be true at all. And then when you find out it actually did happen, you think this is just too irresistible not to do. The fact that this, you know, this is the kind of thing that would be the, the thing of fiction, yet actually in the 70s in Switzerland, two bumbling crooks <laughs> actually did dig up Chaplin and managed to get away with hiding him somewhere for several weeks and was playing like cat and mouse with the police. It's incredible. So it was the fact that it was like inspired by a true story. Um, also the fact that we had the idea of, um, uh, if you have this kind of story, where do you set it in modern times? Because we wanted to do a contemporary version. And we thought, what city represents crime, grifting, cons, that kind of thing, where everyone's kind of got a scam going. And we thought Vegas. And Ken, uh, as, as he has a, he's got a base in Vegas, is very well connected there and was able to uh, sources a lot of great locations and local actors and and get us all sorts of all manner of things that totally uh, make the film look like a million dollars you know um, and so really uh, you know when you throw all those uh, when you throw all those factors in it's a no-brainer you, you, you're gonna bite the hand off someone who offers, who offers you the film and and also it was a great script from Doug so I mean don't tell him I said this uh, he, he can't hear us right he, he's on mute yeah um, uh, it was like, it was a great script, you know, um, I, you, you read it and you're laughing out loud. And if, you, and if, it's, if it's making you laugh out loud when you're reading it, you know that when you're actually doing it, it's going to be, you know, it's going to be something special. Yeah. Yeah. Back to Doug and Simon. You guys oh, just... Oh, I can hear you. Oh. <laughs> oh, damn it. <laughs> now, now, back to Doug and Simon for a second here, because... When you watch the film, I watched it this morning, and, and it's it's a blast. It's it's a whole lot of fun. Did you guys have as much fun filming it as it seemed whenever you're watching it? I I did in the scenes I did that uh, Simon's not in. <laughs> Legally, we're contractually bound to do these interviews together, but after this, we're not allowed to talk to each other because Doug has a restraining order from me. Um, so. It's, but if it's for work, we're allowed to. I'm allowed to touch you. No. These guys, no, no. these guys have these guys have a great chemistry that stems from knowing each other well and having a previous, you know, um, a friendship with each other before they work together on on screen. But and they come to this, you know, D Doug wrote it. Um, Simon had the story in his head for a long time, so they come to it knowing the source material inside and out. So when we come to set. <clears throat> You know they're very good at doing the scenes as written and you get a lot of comedy from those but then both of these guys are very good at playing off each other and riffing and improvising and that kind of thing so once we've got what's written that's when we then go okay you know what we'll do some more but we'll kind of have a bit of fun with this and do you know we'll do some different things and throw whatever you want in there and and sometimes you end up with uh, the you know you go with the scripted version and sometimes you take those little additions that they threw in as well and that i think comes about from a pre-existing chemistry and relationship with each other. That's it's the kind of thing you can't manufacture or fake, you know. Um, so it's a very, it's a very natural thing that comes across on screen with those with those guys. Um, that I'm very pleased with. Right. Most of the most of the cast wanted to be on set when uh, when uh, Simon and Doug did a bit, and uh, but the, the problem with that is it makes it even more challenging then to play the straight part. Um, and come on, because all of us wanted to be kind of funny, but we couldn't be because we had to be the dark element. And uh, you, you know, you could feel it, and it was it was wonderful. I mean, it was a wonderful theater. It's really fun to play a straight part when you know that the the, the comedy part of it is solid. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> well, in, I... those, in those in those cases, the more serious the straight the straight person plays it the funnier it is when it's coming off of uh, the other, you know, the other character, the Doug or the Simon. Sorry, Doug. 
Well, based on your proviso earlier that I couldn't hear you when you were actually being complimentary about me, so long as Simon can't hear me, I, I would say I had a blast doing it. Yeah. I can hear you. Well, I said you couldn't. I want you have to. I give said me I could only say that. You've got to give you me, me earmuffs or something. You can't Jesus, just say you don't that. Do, you don't listen. That's the problem. You oh, say you oh. hear me, but you don't listen. How many more of these have I got to do with him? <laughs> I've done this all day, all day in a room with Doug Phillips. It was wonderful <laughs> for him. Oh. <laughs> Now you so, saw every ex-girlfriend I've ever had. <laughs> one of them. He's only ever had one. Doug, Doug, well, you said you had a wonderful time doing it. Does that mean you'd probably do another one for nothing, huh? Kane, I would do another one, but only double. <laughs> now, now we've got to find six dollars. Oh, great. So I guess my, my next question would be is, Wayne Newton, how do we make this one happen? Well, I, I met Wayne uh, not not too long before we uh, decided to go ahead and shoot this and uh, was able to introduce him at dinner um, uh, to Simon. And uh, Simon kind of then took the the uh, the role of the uh, communicator with uh, with Kat, who is Wayne's wife and uh, his manager. And uh, we did put it together, you know, and it, it worked out well. He's the most wonderful guy in the world. I can't tell you. When, when Simon and I first met him at dinner, first time I've ever met him, Simon was, was sitting there with me, and it was like the three of us had been friends for 10 years. I mean, it was unbelievable. So, uh, so that's kind of how we got him in. His whole family's in. Uh, his wife plays the uh, news reporter uh, on camera, and uh, his daughter plays one of the waitresses. And he was incredibly helpful. I mean, he was really gracious to us. Uh, came and did the role in it. Um, and you know, he's been doing big. You know, he's been doing big uh, movies and TVs for, you know, like four decades. And he doesn't. He doesn't. Have to, he doesn't need to come and do a tiny little indie movie, shooting. You know, running around Vegas with no permits. But he came and did it really graciously. And not only that, he really got us out of a sticky situation. And we were, we were, um, we're mid shoot. Um, we've got a, a location booked a cemetery. Uh, to film the uh, you know the scene where they're digging up Chaplin, and then it, the the location pulled out on us. It cancelled, saying, "Oh, we 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 don't think it's really appropriate to uh, to shoot that there, considering it, you're digging up a body, even though we weren't actually digging up a body." And so we told Wayne this on the day we were filming with him, and we were f due to film the cemetery scene <clears throat> two days following. And he said, "How's it going?" And we said, "Well, we've got this issue." And he said, "Well, why don't you come and shoot in my backyard?" And we sort of laughed and scoffed a bit and said well look you know i think we need something a bit bigger than a backyard but thank you and he said look why don't you come and see my backyard and then you can make a decision and so we said okay so that night we went to his backyard which is a 27 acre ranch um that, that takes up an entire city block in uh, vegas where he breeds arabian horses it's got fields and it's got trees and it's got a stream running through it with a bridge over it and it was perfect. And all we had to do was put dots in a few uh, prop gravestones um, and then come in two nights later with uh, shovels and a pickaxe and dig a very deep hole in the middle of his uh, perfectly manicured lawn. <laughs> who, who dug the hole for? I think the digging was a team effort, wasn't it? We were all there. We were, we all, were there all there. there. We were yeah, all there. Everyone was there. Only one uh, of us has blisters. Yeah. A lot of guys, a lot of energy was spent that evening. Uh, let, the important thing is that you know we uh, that we dug the hole. That's the important thing. And, if, oh, and, and what, okay. what's, what, okay. what's even more important is that we managed to uh, get out of there before Wayne saw that what we'd done to his grass. <laughs> but it, hey, it was funny because when we were there filming, me and Simon went in the guest house that we were using for hair and makeup, and Wayne himself and his wife had forgotten in the corner of one of their cabinets was a three foot tall statue of Charlie Chaplin and we couldn't get over that. That's right. You know, this is a story I really haven't told very often, but I got on the phone and I figured I could help these guys out. Uh, maybe I could find a landscape company with a backhoe, you know, to at least get the thing started. So 
so they wouldn't have to dig uh, literally a six foot hole. And uh, I got this nice lady on the phone and explained to her that we were a movie company and everything else. And that I wanted her to, to just start um, a, a uh, digging a grave in Wayne Newton's uh, backyard. And she said, oh my God, I didn't even know he was sick. And I thought, <laughs> oh my gosh. Well, and it was like, didn't you hear, you know? So we, we basically decided to do it by hand. Yeah, we did. We, we yeah, did. We, we did. Yeah. I, listen, I would have. I had a, I had a, I had an injury, so I couldn't do it. <laughs> I had an injury as well. I couldn't help either. Sorry, yeah. guys. <laughs> All four of you were injured, apparently. <laughs> I, I, I did. I helped. You started that, which was a help, Doug. Did that or did that or did that not help? What's that? Oh, it but did. Anyway, right. But anyway, Wayne, uh, that was another one of the many kind things that Wayne did for us. And it, and yeah. it just sums him up. He's, he really is the nicest guy you've ever met. And, and, he, and he treated us to one of his shows when we were there. We're going to see him singing and doing comedy bits and telling life stories. And it was great. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, you know, we love, we love him for it. Yeah, I mean, we went to the show. We, they gave us a table off to the side, which was wonderful. And uh, they gave us some complimentary cocktails. And then the, uh, the house manager came over to us and moved us to a table front center. And later we realized that in order to do that, they had to move his mother-in-law out of her seat. <laughs> I mean, the guy, I, you, you cannot believe how nice a guy this guy is. I'm serious. So before we go, I like to ask a fun question. Not that we haven't already had enough fun here. But I like to ask a fun question here. Um, and I'll let Ken kick it off as well. What is your go-to karaoke song? Uh, my way. Paul, to you. Oh, uh, my go-to karaoke song is the 12 Days of Christmas. And if you like, I'll now treat you to the line five gold rings. Yeah? All right, here we go. <laughs> I think you'll agree that was something rather special. Was that was good. fantastic. Simon and Thank Doug. You. Let's you go first. Uh, uh, Spice Girls, Spice Up Your Life. <laughs> I bet. All I want for Christmas is me two front teeth. <laughs> now, we're not saying this would be a great show. No, <laughs> but it's the only one we've got. <laughs> what, what, what a DJ set this would be, right? <laughs> it really would be all over the place. Oh, my God. Gentlemen, thank you guys so much for your time today. The film's fantastic. I really do greatly appreciate it. Thank, thank you, Ricky. We appreciate it. Cheers. 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 Bye now.